You now have a good grasp on the basics of MO theory. Reactions occur when a relatively high energy HOMO and a relatively low energy LUMO overlap to create new bonding and antibonding orbitals. You've seen how we can draw this overlap using MO diagrams, which illustrate the relative energies of these orbitals. While that's a useful tool, it's not how we usually draw chemical reactions. For that, we use the curved arrow formalism. Your book refers to them as curly arrows. The authors are British. Curved arrows show the motion of electrons during a single step in a chemical reaction. Every arrow shows the motion of a single pair of electrons and makes and or breaks a bond. A curved arrow almost always begins at the HOMO of the nucleophile and goes toward the largest lobe of the LUMO of the electrophile. Depending on the nature of the interacting HOMO and LUMO, this orbital interaction may force other electrons to move as well. These are also illustrated with additional curved arrows drawn on the same chemical structures. Sometimes, a single arrow will be enough to illustrate a complete reaction. For example, the reaction between ammonia and borane that we saw in an earlier video. The curved arrow starts at the electrons in the HOMO of the nucleophile, here that's the lone pair on nitrogen, and ends at the LUMO of the electrophile, the empty p orbital on boron. I drew in the pictures of the orbitals here just to illustrate where the arrows go. We don't usually need to draw the orbitals themselves. More commonly, two or more arrows are required to show a step in a chemical reaction. This is the case whenever the LUMO of the electrophile is an antibonding orbital. When that's the case, electrons flow from the HOMO of the nucleophile into the antibonding LUMO, since putting electrons into an antibonding orbital breaks the corresponding bond, we need to illustrate that bond breakage with our curved arrows. Let's look at an SN2 reaction, for instance, between cyanide and chloromethane. Cyanide is the nucleophile. Its HOMO is the sp hybridized lone pair on carbon. Chloromethane is the, the electrophile. Its LUMO is CCl sigma star which is largest on the side of the carbon, the less electronegative element. The curved arrows for this reaction start here and go here. This is the overlap of the HOMO and the LUMO. But we're not done. Since the LUMO was CCL sigma star, we've broken the CCL sigma bond. Those bonding electrons are no longer shared between the carbon and the chlorine, so must go somewhere they go toward chlorine, the more electronegative of the two atoms that we're sharing them. There are several critical rules for curved arrow mechanisms. First, every arrow must always begin at an explicitly drawn pair of electrons. They can be either in a bond or a lone pair. Never start an arrow at an atom label unless there's a lone pair drawn on it. Every arrow must end at a place where electrons can reside, either an empty orbital or an atom that can accommodate a new pair of electrons. Next, every arrow represents the motion of one pair of electrons, never more. This means that you can use the number of arrows in a step to show how many electrons are moving in that step. Next, in a given step, arrows always flow in a single direction. Two arrows will never end at the same place. Finally, be careful about combining steps. Every step in a chemical reaction is started by a single homo-lumo interaction. Multiple homo-lumo interactions shouldn't be combined into a single step. Now, there are a few rare exceptions to this rule, when multiple sets of orbitals all must overlap simultaneously in order for a reaction to occur. We'll see this sort of situation starting in class 9.